same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to somebody who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to somebody who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to somebody who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Thank you so much. Big welcome to Kingsgate, Leicester, Cambridge, everyone in Peterborough, to this new season and to this brand new series entitled The Kingdom. Today and over the next four weeks, we're going to look at a subject that is absolutely central to our understanding of God, His purposes in our lives, and it is the Kingdom of God. Some of you will, of course, remember that in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray this way, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what we need to understand is that the kingdom of God is a good thing. It's about the rule and reign of God coming into our lives and into our world. And guess what? When God's rule is established in our lives and around us, it's a good thing. God is a good God, and where the kingdom of God comes, evil and bondage and sin and sickness and death has to flee, and life and love and liberty comes in. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the kingdom of God, and we're looking at something that's absolutely central to the biblical revelation and absolutely core to Jesus' own ministry. It was the focal point of his ministry. He came from heaven, the king himself, to the earth to reestablish the kingdom of God on earth. And he came and demonstrated that the kingdom had come through his ministry by doing incredible acts of kindness and miracles. And then as he began to gather people, started listening to his ministry, he started to teach on the nature of the kingdom of God And the primary way that he would teach was through what we call parables. They were short stories or comparison sayings that would have made um, his hearers understand more easily what he was talking about. I mean, would you agree with me the kingdom of God is quite a big concept? It is, in fact, quite conceptual. What do we mean by the kingdom of God? Well, I think the simplest definition is it's the rule of and reign of God, the rule and reign of God. But what does that actually mean? What does it look like? How do we respond to it? Well, that's what Jesus primarily focuses on in his parables. And what we're going to do over this next uh, four weeks is we're going to look at one of the most concentrated teachings of Jesus on the kingdom, which is in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to focus today on the, the headline parable, the parable of the sower that kind of sets the rest of the chapter up. And then over the the future weeks, we're going to be looking at six other parables of the kingdom. And interestingly, these other parables have this little phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. You sometimes wonder, well, what really is the kingdom of heaven like? 
hopefully as we look at some of these parables, as the Holy Spirit helps us, we will begin to understand something more about what the kingdom of heaven is like and how we are to interact with God's kingdom. And this would be important at any season of our lives because the kingdom of God is a central teaching. But I believe it's particularly important for us at Kingsgate that we look at the kingdom because of our 2020 vision. For those of you who uh, have got Uh, good memories and we're around in January, February, you'll know that 2020 vision, we're called to do what? To turn the church inside out and then to see breakthrough in all our centers ready for multiplication in years to come. To turn the church inside out. And we talked about how the fact that while we need to gather together under the lordship of the king, that's why we come together in our meetings and in our groups, but it's not enough just to come together and gather inside, we have to go outside and do what? Live as kingdom ambassadors. So if we're to understand what it means to be kingdom ambassador, we obviously first need to understand what it means to be in the kingdom and what the kingdom means. And that's what this series is about. So already, how many think we're going to need the help of the Holy Spirit? So Lord, will you help us please? Help me as I teach. Help me us as we receive today in Jesus' name. So let's start with the first of the series, looking at the parable of the sower. It's a great place to start. It appears in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke. And it's one of the very few parables where we get the parable and we also get the interpretations of the parable. And today, looking at the parable of the sower, I want to focus on this theme that I believe is central to this parable, and it's this. The kingdom is a fruitful kingdom. The kingdom is a fruitful kingdom. Now, this summer, the Lord's been really speaking to me about fruitfulness. It started at the end of July when one of our neighbors came bounding up to me, um, really excited, wanting to give me a great big punnet of her homegrown apricots. So I thought, fantastic. So I, I took the apricots gladly and then... A few days later, one of our Kingsgate ladies gave Karen and myself a humongous hamper of fresh fruit, mangoes, pineapples. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. By this time, I'm thinking, Lord, are you speaking to me about healthy diet and five a day? (laughs) And then another one of our neighbors, actually a Kingsgate member, came, knocked on the door and gave us two punnets of their fresh... um, plums, which were incredible. And by now I'm thinking, Lord, I'm beginning to get it here. How many know that sometimes we can be a bit spiritually dense and God has to speak more than once? (laughs) Well, I don't want to be spiritually dense, but the Lord was speaking in a number of ways. And then the lady who brought the big hamper came with another big hamper. And on a card, she wrote both times this word, fruitful. Now, I don't know how God speaks to you, but for me, it was loud and clear that God was saying something to me, to Karen, but I took it as a word for us at Kingsgate that we're about to go into a season of increased, greater, and extraordinary fruitfulness. Come on, yeah, give God praise for that. Greater fruitfulness, both in our lives, but also through our lives. So I believe that's at the promise at the heart of the parable sower. The parable of the sower is about seed that's sown. It starts as a tiny seed because of the power and the goodness in the seed. When it gets into right soil, into good soil, it produces a harvest. In this count in Matthew, 160, 30 times what was sown. And Jesus' hearers who would have come from primarily from a rural background, would all know all about sowing. And so Jesus tells the parable, they say, yeah, we know about sower sowing seed, and some goes on the path, and some amongst the rocky ground, some amongst the thorns, and some amongst the good soil, and then it gets a harvest. How much? Up to a hundred times? In other words, Jesus is saying something surprising to them, that this is about not just a natural harvest, this is about a spiritual harvest, an extraordinary harvest that comes when we receive the seed of the kingdom. How many up for an over-the-top harvest in your life and through your life? That's what I'm believing God for. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the parable from two angles. We're going to start by looking at it 
as if we are the soils and we are receiving the word. And then in three hours' time, I'm going to turn, no or not. In a short while, we're going to, I saw somebody going, Phew. And then we're going to turn around and we're going to look at the parable from the other way, which is going to look at it from the perspective of the sower. So us as the soils, but also us working alongside the sower. And we're going to look at the first part, us as the soils, is about the harvest in us, and then working with the sower, talking about what God wants to do through us. Got it? So first, let's look at the promise of a greater harvest in our lives extraordinary fruitfulness in our lives. What does that look like and what does it mean? Well, immediately what comes to mind as I think about a kingdom harvest in our lives, one of my favorite verses is Romans 14, verse 17, and it says this, the kingdom of God, so that's our subject, right? The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So as I'm thinking, God, you're speaking about fruitfulness, and you're speaking it to me, but you're speaking it to all of us in Kingsgate. What's the promise here that if we allow the seed to go on good soil, our hearts, what's the the fruit going to be? What's the harvest going to be? A greater harvest of righteousness, and a greater harvest of peace, and a greater harvest of joy in the Holy Spirit. Why in the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is the very presence of God in the here and now in our lives. When you accept Jesus as king, his government in your life, and you surrender your life fully to God, the Holy Spirit, who comes to live on side of us, guess what he's going to bring? He's not going to bring bad stuff. He's not going to bring hopelessness. He's not going to bring despair. He's not going to bring depression. He's going to bring righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He's going to bring the atmosphere of heaven into our lives. Come on, you can look excited about that, wherever you're gathered. The atmosphere of heaven, the rule and reign of the King. And looking back at our series on wisdom, how many of you thought that was a great series and you want more wisdom in your life? Well, if we receive more of the government of God, if we receive more of Jesus' rule and reign in our lives, guess what's going to happen? We're going to have more wisdom. And if you look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, there's a whole list of the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to receive more love in our lives. So I believe there's a promise here of an increased harvest in our lives. So the question is, what's the attitude that we need to to adopt? If we are looking at it from the perspective of the soils... There's only one of the four soils that actually produced a harvest. And the three negative examples, the path, the rocky ground, and the thorny soil, are all teaching us something, and this is the attitude we need to adopt. Get ready. If we, if we want a greater harvest of the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in, in the Holy Spirit in our lives, what do we need to do? We need to fully receive the seed of the kingdom. Can we say just those two words? Fully receive the seed of the kingdom. So the question is, what's the seed of the kingdom? What's the seed of the kingdom? Well, here in Matthew, Jesus makes clear, in the interpretation, he says the seed of the kingdom is the message about the kingdom. The message about the kingdom And in Mark's account, he simply says the seed is the Word. And in Luke, he simply says it's the Word of God. So we can put those together. How does God's kingdom, the message about Jesus, who he is, what he's done for us, and how we can partner with his rule in our lives, how do we primarily receive what he wants to do in our lives? It comes in seed form, and it comes through the Word. How many say that the the primary way that you came to Christ was because you heard a word and you received it? The word and the spirit working together produce the new birth in our lives. So the word needs to be received, not just to become a Christian, but how many want greater fruitfulness? But if we want to grow and see a greater harvest in our lives, then we need to keep on fully receiving 
the seed of the kingdom, the Word of God in our lives. So let's see what we can learn from these four different soils. And um, if you can imagine, Jesus, he's teaching. He's teaching a big crowd. The crowd was so big that he had to go out into the boat and preach from the boat on the lake to the crowd on the shore. And he knows that there's, as people are listening, they're going to be all different stages on their spiritual journey, just like in our gatherings. And he knows that, and so he wants to encourage people to fully receive the seed of the kingdom. And say, can I say, if you're here just checking Christianity out, whether you've been on the journey for a while and you still don't seem to be making any progress, all the way through to whether you, whether you feel like you're a fully surrendered, fully surrendered follower of Jesus Christ, this message is something for you. Amen? So let, let's see what we can learn. Firstly, let's learn not to be like the seed was sown on the path. Now, the path was hardened ground. It would have been the side of the field, and some of the seed, just because they, you know, he would have gone out and manually scattered the seed, some of that seed would have gone on the path, and it wouldn't have germinated, and the birds would have taken it away. I had a similar experience a couple of months ago. Our lawn was in serious need of repair. And being Mr. Practical, <laughs> I thought, right, I'm going to go and scatter some seed. Problem is, the ground was hard and dry. Guess what happened? The jolly birds took the seed. <laughs> so not to be put off, I went back and started throwing more seed. And <laughs> until eventually I realized I needed to just give the soil a bit of help, loosen it a bit. And then guess what? We've got a now beautiful green lawn. Hallelujah. But that's what's happening here. That's what he's saying here. He's saying that, and he says it in the interpretation, that the seed going on the path is like hearts that are hardened, don't understand and can't receive the word, and so not just now birds stealing the word, but the devil comes and he robs the word before it can germinate. How many of you don't want the devil stealing anything out of your life, including the word of God? And that applies whether we're still trying to understand Christianity, whether we're on the journey. Let's instead, let's, let's t adopt the opposite attitude. How do we make sure that our hearts aren't hardened? Let's cultivate a greater openness and softness to receiving the Word of God in our lives. Let's check ourselves out. Let's cultivate a greater open. Secondly, let's not be like the rocky ground. Now, when we say rocky ground, very often we'll think ground with lots of stones in it. But in, in the context of Jesus' day, it would have been soil that just was like a thin layer of topsoil, and underneath there would have been lots of bedrock or limestone. So the seed, this, this ground is obviously better than the first because initially the seed goes in and it quickly produces some growth. Problem is, because it's shallow and there's rocks there, it can't, the, the seed cannot put down deep roots. Problem with that is, is that when the sun comes, scorches the, the plant, it withers and it dies. And Jesus said it's like this. Some people receive the word with joy, but because they don't allow the word to, ha to, to ha put down, as it were, roots in the soil of their heart, when trouble or testing or persecution comes, they quickly fall away. Now, I don't know about you, I don't want to be just temporarily thrilled by the word. I want to be permanently transformed. Anyone else? I don't want to be a shallow Christian. I don't want to be somebody who, I'm, I'm up when everything's fine, when life is good, when everyone's nice to me, when there's no pressure, but I want to be somebody who allows the Word of God to go deep in my life, that even in tough times I continue to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Let's not be like the rocky ground. Let's allow the Word of God to go deep into our lives. Thirdly, let's not be like the soil with thorns. I think this maybe particularly speaks, I'm sure it did then, and into our culture today. Here's the seed. It's not hard ground. 
There's no problem with the depth of the soil. And so the seed begins to go into the ground. The plant begins to grow. But the thorns, the weeds, begin to choke the seed. Uh, we had our um, day off yesterday, and I was looking forward to it until Karen announced, I think we need to do some weeding. I'm like, I was thinking of playing. I wasn't thinking of weeding. Anyway, two hours later, oh, I hate weeds. Dandelions are from the devil, I'm sure. Well, somebody told me that apparently you can eat them. I'm going to pass on that one. But after a couple of hours of digging those things in, it was hard work, but I was glad because when you look back, what a transformation in our garden. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants our lives to continually be transformed because guess what? Just as in, the, in Jesus' day, there were people where the Word was going in, but other things were choking the seed of the Word of God in their lives. How many know that the other things can choke God's seed, God's presence, God's work, God's word, God's kingdom in our lives? And here Jesus mentions two. Has this ever choked what God wants to do in your life? Worry? Then he mentions riches. In Luke he mentions pleasures. And as Karen said last week in the end of the wisdom series, it's not that some of these things, worry is always bad. It's not that riches and pleasures are necessarily negative, but they are if we prioritize them over what God wants to do. Can I say the kingdom of God is not a list of priorities on our life. It's the main, it's the main thing. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. It's so important we put the kingdom first. And so let's not be like the soil with thorns in it. Let's not let the Word of God and the work of God be choked in our lives. Let's get rid of unhelpful distractions so that God's Word can work unhindered in our lives. How many want a great harvest? Then we need to fully receive the Word of God. And when we do, we could become like, and many of us I know are seeking to live our lives like this, like the good soil. This is the soil that fully receives the seed. Fully receives it. What does that mean? Well, it, here in Matthew, it means those who receive the word by understanding it. In Mark's account, he uses the word, those who accept the word. You've got to understand, accept it. And then in, in Luke, he says, those who also persevere with the word. How many know sometimes it takes perseverance to see a harvest? A number of months ago, I started out on a kind of like a new spiritual devotional journey. And I was uh, working with somebody, helping me, sort of like an external uh, source, just helping me grow deeper with the Lord. And after a couple of months, for some reason, I was just feeling a bit frustrated at what I felt was the lack of progress that I was making. And I started talking this to him, and he got to the measure of me now that I had the odd hint of impatience, impatience in my personality. And he said... You know, he used an agriculture analogy. He said, when you plant seeds and you don't see anything immediately happening, you don't go back and dig up the seed and see what's happening, do you? You trust the process. And I believe for some of us, we need to know that God is not a short-term fixed God. He's a long-term... God who, who wants to do a thorough and a deep and a long-term work in our lives. And if we will keep understanding the Word, and we will keep accepting the Word, and we will keep persevering with the Word that we hear on Sunday, the Word that we get in our daily devotions, but also, I believe sometimes God is speaking a specific Word into our lives. I know it's the same with me. It's like He's speaking about this. And have you noticed that God doesn't often change message until we've really embraced it. Don't just say, oh, I'm bored with that, move on. No, let God's Word do a deep work in your life. If you want to be transformed, you have to persevere with the Word to produce great harvest of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen? I believe that's a word for a whole bunch of people there. Persevere with what God is saying and watch what He's going to do. It's going to be abundance of 
fruit. 160, 30 times what was sown. And that's something that we can do. We can adopt an attitude, even today, to say we're going to fully receive the word. And then let's use this 10 days of prayer and fasting coming up across all of Kingsgate to say, Lord, I want you to do a deeper work in my life. I want to cultivate greater openness. I want to develop deeper roots. I want to get rid of unhelpful distractions. Will you please do a deeper work in me? Can I have an amen from somewhere? That's the first thing. Let's believe for and partner with the Holy Spirit to see a greater harvest in our lives. But let's not stop there. Let's turn the corner and look at the parable from the other way around in order that we might receive the promise of a greater harvest through our lives. Greater harvest in our lives, then a greater harvest through our lives. What is a greater harvest through our lives look like? Well, in John 4, verse 35, many of you know the story of Jesus with the Samaritans. Jesus used this phrase. He talks about the fields are white unto harvest. What was the harvest Jesus was talking about? He was talking about the fruit of his life and ministry in other people's lives. And then in Romans 1, verse 13, for example, Paul talks to the Romans about, he says, I want to, I've planned many times to go and see you in order that I might reap a harvest in your life. In other words, Jesus, like Paul, like the gospel writers, like the writers of the New Testament, all were saying that to be a kingdom ambassador has a twofold dimension. We receive the seed of the kingdom, but then secondly, we go out and we partner with the sower to sow seeds in other people's lives. We adopt a proactive attitude in sowing. A bit like Liana and her Kingsgate friends in Boston. Please watch this. Hello, my name is Liana. I live in Boston. I moved to the UK in 2004 with my family. I've got three children and I work as a teacher assistant in primary school. So when we moved to England, we started to look for a good church and we find Kingsgate. And it was great news for us because we were enjoying uh, Sunday service every time. But one day, me and my family and my relative's family, we decided we would like to share what we've got because we were so full of what God is doing with, in our life. And we agreed in prayer with my family and my relative's family that we would like to go uh, and start uh, leading life group in Boston. We came to Boston Stamp uh, Church and we asked for the room, if they've got anything, and they've got the room. and they give the room straight away to us for free. It was the room, big room in the center of town. We can see the blessing of God straight away. Sometimes it's good to come in beautiful church and feel good and comfortable here, welcome. But I'd like to share that with other people because they also need to know about Jesus and God's love. Uh, for example, this Easter we had five people baptized in church and uh, they're coming to life group uh, and I can see how they're changing slowly, slowly, how Jesus is changing them. Now we've got two groups, life groups <laughs> this year. And for example, uh, one lady, she came to our group and uh, she had pretty bad depression. So when we prayed, God healed her heart. And now I can see uh, how smiley she's always, she's always coming happy to life group. And she got a new job as well in office. So she's always uh, smiling to the customers. So I can see a great transformation. And another lady also, she had very, very bad uh, problem with uh, health and uh, God to start to heal her slowly, slowly, she getting better. And she already started to help us in our uh, group and she inviting new people, that's amazing, isn't it? God is great. We're so grateful to Pastor Dave and um, his wife Karen. They came to Peterborough because they uh, follow God's will. But now it's our time for you and for me to go to people and tell about Jesus' love because we are inside our church, and it's so simple, just share it. Isn't that fantastic? I love that. Group who've been coming, gathering, receiving the word, let God do 
his work in their lives, but they weren't content to hold on to it. They were going out and freely distributing the seed of the kingdom to other people. And so as we look back at this parable, we need to realize that that is what Jesus is saying. He's saying that if we want a greater harvest through our lives, we need to freely sow the seed of the kingdom. See, if we want a harvest in our lives, we have to fully receive the seed. But if we want to see a greater harvest through our lives, we need to freely sow it. Who is the sower in the parable that Jesus is referring to? It would first and foremost have been himself. He's talking about his ministry. He's there preaching to this crowd. And already by Matthew 13, he's begun to experience mixed response to his message. Can I encourage you? You know, if you are out there sowing and you're thinking, well, not everybody's receiving. Well, you're in good company. It was the same with Jesus. And as he starts sowing, he realizes that not everybody is receiving, all different levels, but some are beginning to receive his message. They become disciples and they start bearing great fruit. And then I believe this parable is almost like a prophetic parable telling what's going to happen after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, when he's at the right hand of the Father. Because on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's poured out on these disciples, and they go out and they take the good news of the kingdom and word and deed, don't they? And they don't just keep it to themselves. They, in fact, they go on enormous journeys all around until eventually the gospel gets to these shores. Praise God. Aren't you glad? But it's still a parable that's relevant today. Because we are involved in partnering with the Lord. Kingdom ambassadors who are not just soil, we are to be sowers who take what God has given us and freely sow it wherever we go. Uh, I was recently speaking at a couple of Christian camps. Thanks for those who prayed. Had a really great time. And on one of the camps, a man came up to me, never met him before. And he said, I got a word for you from the Lord. And then knowing nothing about what the Lord had been speaking to me on fruitfulness, knew nothing about what I was going to be speaking on this Sunday, this is how he started. He said, I believe the Lord is increasing the flow of kingdom seed from his storehouse. And I'm like, okay, you got my attention, Lord. And then he started prophesying about a wonderful harvest. And he started literally prophesying from the parable of the sower about how the receptivity of the fields is going to increase. And once again, I took that not just a word for me. I thought, yes, Kingsgate, come on, we're going into a new season. And God is going to be increasing the flow of seed into our lives. He's going to, there's a promise of a wonderful harvest and there's a promise of increasing receptivity to the Word in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah, come on, let's give the Lord praise. So, if we want to see an increased harvest through our lives, what do we got to do? Well, if we look at the sower, there's a couple of things that strike me as obvious that we can learn. The first is, don't keep the seed in the storehouse. Yeah? Don't keep the seed in the seed bag. <laughs> You see, the, the, the picture of here is that Jesus is talking about the sower, the farmer, knows that when he goes out, there's power in this seed that's in his bag. But the seed's not going to do any good remaining just in the seed bag with the other seeds. That was really profound there. Is that right? There's power in the seed, but the seed has to be sown. If Jesus hadn't sowed the word in his ministry, it would have stopped with him. If the disciples had kept the good news of Jesus themselves, we wouldn't be here today. And so this whole inside-out message that I want to remind us of at the start of September as looking ahead to the next four years is yes, we need to come and allow the Lord to do a deeper work in us. We've got to keep gathering. We've got to keep allowing God to bring a greater harvest in our lives. But the message is that we need to start going out with new boldness and love and passion and creativity and find people who are ready to receive the seed of the kingdom and see a great harvest 
in their lives. That's the first thing. Don't keep the seed in the storehouse. But there's a second thing in this, which is, let me encourage you, like the sower, keep on sowing until you find good soil. See, Jesus' hearers would have known this, that the sower wouldn't have been discouraged by the fact that a few seeds fell on the path. That was just agricultural life. He wouldn't have been discouraged by the fact that some seeds would fell amongst the thorns and on rocky ground. He just knew that if he could find some good soil, he would have a harvest. Let me be clear what I'm not saying, and let me apply this to our lives. You see, I think sometimes we can get discouraged because we're trying to sow one little seed into, into one area, and we can give up. Yes, we need to pray for and keep earnestly seeking God for and do all we can to reach everybody we possibly know. I'm not talking about giving up on people and situations. We need to realize while at the moment the, some of the seeds, the soils that you're sowing in look unreceptive, there are literally thousands and tens of thousands of people all around our Kingsgate venues of people who are ready to receive the Word of God and the life of God and would just love to have eternal life. would love to have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And part of what Inside Out is about is we're not just continue sowing where we are. We're going to go with a new boldness, a new creativity, working together and on our own to say, God, by your Holy Spirit, help me sow seeds into good soil that's ready soil so that they can produce a harvest and they can reach their friends and their world too. Amen? That's what it's about. And I'm just really encouraged at sort of early stories coming in of people who are taking this, uh, this, this inside out vision and they're becoming bold and proactive. I, just one example from Leicester, heard about they did a pray, serve and share event recently into the local community. And one lady was just so blessed by the whole event, felt so welcome, so loved, came to church and gave her life to the Lord. You see, you sow and you reap. And then heard about uh, Kingsgate, Cambridge, and the leadership team, when, when we started sharing the inside-out vision, they felt really challenged personally, I'm sure like many of us. And so they made a decision that when they came together, they would pray for each other about this. And they would hold one another account accountable. How are we doing in reaching the people in our world? And no sooner after they'd, they'd, they'd started this commitment to pray for one another and to become more intentional, one of the couples um, saw a whole family that they, they, they were connected with come to Christ. Another couple, I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm right, hadn't seen a single person come to their life in their whole life. And this couple must be late 50s, early 60s. And they'd been sharing the love of Jesus in practical ways with a particular elderly, uh, elderly woman, and then suddenly she comes to Christ, and just as well, because very shortly after, she dies and goes to be with the Lord, just in time, eternal salvation, amen? And, and I'm inspired by many stories around Peter, but one that strikes me is somebody I know quite well, one of our life group leaders. Every time I meet her, she's got a new story about somebody who she's connected with through school and at the school gates, and how a number of them have come on Alpha, some of them have come to church, some of them have got Christians, but her attitude is, you can just see, there's just one of these people who just loves people and serves people with a grace and a compassion, just wants to bring more and more people to Christ, and I'm challenged and I'm inspired by that, those stories. How about you? And just imagine with me if all of us said, Lord, we want to be like the good soil. We want to fully receive the Word of God in life, but we also want to be like the sower, and we want to partner with Jesus' kingdom mission that still is alive and active on planet Earth today. And we want to go both in our neighborhoods and ultimately to the nations, for those who are near to us and those who are far. And let's adopt the attitude of freely sowing the kingdom seed. Because guess what? There's power in the seed. It's God's word. It will transform people's lives. And so will you join me in saying, yes, Lord, do a deeper work in my life today. Lord, I want to be somebody who fully receives 
the seed of the kingdom. I don't want to be closed. I don't want to be shallow. I don't want to be compromising. I ask you to do a deeper work in my life. And I believe for a greater harvest of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then, Lord, I pray you would anoint me and anoint every one of us with a new boldness, a new courage, a new sensitivity, new faith and expectancy to take the seed of the kingdom of God in word and deed. Thank you for the thousands. Thank you for the multitudes. And I thank you for the ones whose, whose destiny now and eternity is going to be changed because we said yes to your word. We became fellow sowers with you. So help us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.